I love true crime with a passion. On the weekends, I'd spend hours on end looking into analysis videos that go over the most complicated or infamous criminals there were to be explained. But as this year-long spring break comes to a close, I've long since rewatched the same videos two or three times over. And let me tell you, there's only so much enjoyment you can get from your third replay of anything, really. This development led me to start branching out, getting me more invested into the trials for these crimes rather than the crimes themselves. I vividly remember when I told my family about my lack of media entertainment regarding true crime and my mom was just like, don't worry, I've got just the thing, before sending me 10 plus hours of trial footage for the case of Letitia Stout. Though, for some of these cases, it's difficult to determine whether or not there's a criminal on trial at all. One of these cases that comes to mind is the case of James Prokovitz. Mr. Prokovitz was accused of killing his wife on April 25th, 2013, with her body missing even to this day. As the jury eventually reached a verdict on February 27th, 2021, nearly eight years later, they found him guilty of perjury on two occasions, because he lied on the stand about his relationship status following his wife's disappearance, resisting an officer, and the murder of his wife. Personally, while I believe he was definitely guilty of perjury and resisting an officer, I don't think he should have been convicted for his wife's murder. I mean, there wasn't enough evidence to prove he was the one who committed this murder, if there even was one, in the first place. For starters, his wife's body was nowhere to be found, so it's nearly impossible to tell whether or not foul play was involved. Additionally, his wife was already depressed and attempted suicide before, even following one of her previous attempts with, next time nobody will find my body. Yet, the evidence from Mr. Prokovitz was not as strong as the evidence against him. Apparently, lying to the court isn't a popular pastime as one would make it out to be. Side note, this is a joke, uh, please don't lie in court. And in this particular case, it was enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty. It was around this point I started to realize that the evidence in this trial led to what I believe to be a bad outcome which then could lead to negative consequences both for Mr. Prokovitz's family as well as his wife's family. This then led me to believe that evidence can have both good and bad consequences, and that the bad consequences can, more often than not, lead to even more crime in the future. The short answer is yes, it can. The long answer is yes, it can in several ways. For example, let's say I was in the process of being found guilty for second degree arson, hypothetically. I was the only one found near the scene, my handprints were found on the gallon of gasoline that was discovered to be the accelerant, and my fight or flight response chose flight when the authorities arrived. This evidence is all pretty damning, and I was found guilty for second degree arson, hypothetically. But let's say that I didn't actually commit this crime. Maybe I was near the scene because it was my neighbor's house that burned down, and my handprints were found on the oil drum because I had left it outside my garage, which made it easier for anyone with gloves on to use. Also, I only fled the police because I fear authority. Yet, when I was taken to court and given a trial, I was found to be guilty of a felony based on evidence that could have been disproven, but wasn't convincing enough. Now I'm serving up to 20 years in prison, essentially ending any careers, relationships, or aspirations I may have had up until that point, because who would hire someone who's been convicted of a felony? I'm also only 18 at the time of conviction, so I'll never get to experience things like having a drink with my family, or renting a car, or buying a house until I'm at most 38. Not to mention that my family and friends would receive the same treatment as me because, as I said, nobody wants to associate with a felon. Of course, it's not always as cut and dry as this, since in a real case as serious as the one I'm describing, I'd be guaranteed a lawyer to help prove my innocence. However, in some instances, it's considered to be an open and shut case. Stepping away from the hypothetical for a second here, I recently spoke with Dr. Cardwell, a professor at UTSA, who said that evidence, like the example I just used, would be considered bad or faulty for lack of a better term, and in due time there's a chance that it can be used to get me exonerated. 
Organizations such as the Innocence Project have made a name for themselves by seeking out people who are on death row for a crime they didn't commit and make an effort to free them. However, even if that were to happen, the process for it takes an incredibly long time, and while they wait, they have to adapt to life in prison. Another UTSA professor, Professor Booker, says that once someone, whether it be a juvenile, someone who's under 18, or an adult, enters prison or juvenile placement, they're leaving our mainstream culture and entering a completely different one, where they have to learn the rules of said new culture and adapt to the new normal. More often than not, the more time someone spends in places like these, the more likely a person is to take on these norms as a part of themselves, which causes problems both if and when they are released from them. This exact reason is why when people are incarcerated for extended periods of time and are released from prison, they seldom make it. Not to say this is all the time, of course. That, or even when you are eligible for parole, you still have to wait for your minimum sentence to be served. Then you have to await a verdict, and by that point, you've become so adjusted to life in prison that you can't or even sometimes don't want to leave. This clip from TJ Parcell's Fish, A Boy in a Man's Prison, I think, perfectly sums up the point I'm trying to make here. They talked about their time and nickels and dimes, serving a quarter deuce, 25 years to life. Now that's a m****. Because with a quarter deuce, you don't see the parole board until you're done serving the full 25. And by then, it's quite possible you may not want to leave this mother... You get it. Now you understand the effects of this waiting time and how it can be very damaging, which is why false convictions are so dangerous. I bet you're thinking, wow, evidence can have really bad consequences. We should tone back on the use of evidence and just judge based on fairness. I disagree. Fairness, while important, doesn't always mean justice, and I think that's where a lot of people get confused when they describe something as unjust in place of unfair. We all know the phrase, an eye for an eye, but do we all know the rest of it? An eye for an eye and the world goes blind. The justice system is in place to avoid a world in which justice always equals fairness. Look, I know that saying justice isn't fair it seems bad taken out of context, but allow me to describe a scenario for you. Taken straight from one of the more well-known crime shows, Law & Order Special Victims Unit. In Season 19, Episode 3 of SVU, a man by the name of Jason Carr raped a woman named Evelyn Bundy, and in turn, she castrated him years later. As things progressed, it was clear that this case was lining up to be that her actions were justified because they were fair. This then leads to the following scene from Barba, the prosecuting attorney. Hasn't he suffered enough? My vote is yes. He has. I mean, Jason assaulted Evelyn, Evelyn assaulted him back. That sounds fair to me. It sounds like justice at work. To be just, it has to be fair. I mean, that's what Miss Rivers asserts. You know, I can't really disagree with that. In purely pound of flesh terms, Mr. Carr certainly gave up a hell of a lot more than he got. Fair? Not a chance. To be totally fair, you should give Jason one of Evelyn's breasts. An arm, maybe. That's only fair. And as we have now decided, that means it's just. Jason Carr forcibly raped Evelyn Bundy when she was little more than a child. But to tack a prison sentence on Mr. Carr's already gargantuan suffering would tip the balance of justice in Miss Bundy's favor and hey, there's no way that's fair, so there's no way that's just. A man whose store burns down rushes out, buys some gasoline, a book of matches, and sets the house of the arsonist on fire. Hey, it's fair, so that means it's just. A man whose children have been murdered buys a gun and splatters the brains of the killer's children all over their bedroom walls. It's fair, it's just. Why bother with cops or courts? If it's fair, it has to be just. Let the blood flow in the streets, I say. Oh, wait, you don't like it? I say get a bigger pair of boots. 
And while Carr was found guilty in the end, the closing argument makes a really good point. Justice isn't always fair, which is why things like our justice system are so necessary, because fairness and justice are not and never will be the same thing, as much as all of us want it to be. Circling back to our first case, the case of James Prokovitz, it's clear to see that it was not handled as well as it could have been. Mr. Prokovitz was found guilty of the following in his case. First degree intentional homicide, resisting and or obstructing an officer, perjury before the court with a conspiracy to commit murder, and perjury before the court. And while he definitely deserved to be found guilty of his perjury and obstruction charges, I believe there was not enough evidence to say that he was the one who killed his wife. In fact, there was a lot of evidence that said the opposite, but was not considered to be enough, such as his wife's suicide attempts in the past, her depression diagnosis, or her saying that next time, nobody's going to find me, following one of her previous suicide attempts. Yet, Mr. Prokovitz was found to be guilty and sentenced to life in prison, even without the presence of his wife's body, taking on even more prison time on top of the well-deserved perjury and obstruction charges. This means that he will live out the rest of his natural life within prison, leaving the rest of us to wonder if he really did kill his wife, and if the jury made the right decision, even with a lack of convincing evidence. The family of Mr. Prokovitz's wife, I'm sure, feel there is some sense of closure to be had, but is that because this case was fair, or because this case was just? All in all, evidence is supposed to be treated like a good thing, and it should be handled that way. Because if it's not, then we end up with things like false convictions or no convictions for a very guilty person. And without evidence, we would have no criminal justice system. And without that, the world as we know it would descend into anarchy. And as much as I like to think the system is in dire need of reformation, I also think that we cannot thrive without it. That'll be all for me this time. Thank you to the following people for helping me on this project. I wouldn't have been able to get this kind of information without your help. And thank you to Sergeant Joshua Wright for helping me ask the right questions in the right ways. And thank you to Dr. Raj Imani for being my faculty advisor and for helping me with editing my scripts and blogs for this project. And lastly, thank you, viewer, for listening to this little white cat go on about the consequences of evidence. As always, happy trails.